Over the past several weeks, many prominent YouTubers have been spreading misinformation and FUD on the internet about how the Chinese economy is supposed to miraculously collapse within the next few days. Today we are looking at one such video from a major YouTuber named Graham Stephan, and we'll then try to underscore various misinformations uttered through the video. What's up guys, it's Graham here. So throughout the last few weeks, you'll probably come across some content referencing the downfall of China's entire economy, how it's positioned to collapse in the next 30 days, and why their debt crisis is spiraling out of control. In fact, I made a video covering several of those points just a week ago, which detailed just how badly their markets were being affected. But since then, China managed to do the unthinkable by lowering interest rates and injecting even more money into the economy. Graham is here happily criticizing the policy of lowering interest rates and stimulating an economy that facing slowdown, however that is the most standard practice in the capitalistic economic system. The only way, the US managed to get its economy back up in 2008 and 2020 is through stimulus and accommodative monetary policy. The only time a country does the opposite of that, is when the economic growth is already quite strong and there is a risk of runway inflation. So, Graham Stephan is basically passing a baseless argument here. As a last-ditch effort to stay afloat a little bit longer. See, not only are they experiencing one of the worst housing bubbles in history, but their economic slowdown has already begun to impact the rest of the world. And there are some serious implications for all of us that you should be made aware of, because it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, but instead when, and that is something that needs to be addressed. Although before we start, I've heard reports of dislike bots attacking videos like this to suppress the information and prevent it from gaining any traction. So if you wouldn't mind doing me a quick favor and hitting the like button or subscribing for the YouTube algorithm, it would help out tremendously. So thank you guys so much. And now with that said, let's begin. All right, now up until recently, China was on an unstoppable trajectory set to overtake anyone or anything that stood in its way. That's because for the last 30 years, China's been at the forefront of production, international investment, and rapid productivity, all because of an exchange that occurred back in 1979, which gave China diplomatic relations with the United States and by extension, the rest of the world. All of a sudden, China shared a common objective with the global economy, and with that door having been opened, money poured in. Countries from around the world invested in Chinese infrastructure, took advantage of low-cost labor, and helped bring much-needed funding to areas which were previously closed off. Even though this did bring down the cost for almost every item that we use day-to-day, -day, the benefits for China were monumental. With all the increased trade and worldwide investment, 400 million people were lifted from poverty. In addition to that, their economy is now 11 times larger today than it was in 2001, and were even touted as the world's economic miracle while they grew at a faster pace than every other nation. Graham is once again happily talking on about the well-known Chinese success story that everyone knows, but is failing to show any real macroeconomic research about why an economy of the size and scale of China can collapse so easily. First, we have the impact of a zero COVID policy. This quite literally means that there's no tolerance for the spread of COVID to the point where China will enforce strict lockdowns, maintain tight regulation, and do anything in their power to prevent the population from becoming infected. But it has begun to already take its toll. Chinese stocks have experienced their worst quarter in years. Their economy has begun to lose ground as global recession fears increase. Supply chains have continued to be severely impacted by a backlog of shipping, and their growth is expected to be non-existent. Not to mention, these policies are so strict that all citizens must use a health code app that dictates who can move around the capital and where. If your health code turns red, you're sent to isolation along with anyone you've come into contact with who could also be deemed as high risk. These implications have made their daily life a constant challenge, compounding even further on second the real estate market. Just as China's economy had been rapidly expanding, nothing saw an increase as large as the housing market or prices rose by nearly 700% from 2001 to 2017. In fact, the Chinese government recognized that this was becoming a major issue, so they imposed regulations on who was able to get a loan. But it was too little too late. Large developers took advantage of all the real estate enthusiasm by selling pre-built units that didn't even exist, with the assumption that they would be worth a lot more in the future by the time they were eventually complete. Citizens bought into completely vacant cities as a way to store wealth, and excessive demand meant that there was very little oversight to ensure that all of these properties were actually being built. Now, in a market that's constantly going up, this wouldn't be an immediate issue because developers could always raise more capital by selling even more pre-built units. But 
But with sales having completely collapsed in their worst property downturn on record, those previous projects are now being completely abandoned, leaving buyers to fend for themselves and forcing them to make payments on a property that isn't even being built. And finally, the third nail in the coffin, the debt bubble. The Wall Street Journal reports that from 2014 to 18, China's debt has inflated by 20% annually. Housing prices are nearly twice the levels that led to the great financial crisis of 2008, and China continues to loosen lending requirements to ensure that growth is maintained at all costs, even at the expense of the global economy. Graham is correct about the lockdowns in China this year, and their severe impact on the economy. But one needs to also remember the times when the entire world was having lockdowns and China was enjoying a fairly normal functioning economy. So, these lockdowns are mostly a transitory event that we won't even remember one year from now. Coming to the debt bubble part, it's true that Chinese debt has been skyrocketing of late. But one also needs to understand that China has one of the lowest debts for the size of its economy. China is officially reported as having a debt-to-GDP ratio of 73% by the IMF. This, in contrast is way below Japan and the United States, both of whom have more than 100% debt-to-GDP ratio. Needless to say, China can easily borrow more debt to stimulate its massive economy without too much risk of a default. Thanks to its massive trade surplus, China also has a mountain of foreign currency reserves which it can easily use to stabilize its currency and pay for higher import costs. Besides lower oil demand resulting in cheaper prices of the gas pump, there are a few key points to watch out for. The first is through the delisting of Chinese stocks in the U.S. stock exchange. In just the last few days, five state-owned companies were removed from the U.S. stock market, citing high administrative burden and costs as the reason for their decision. However, the timing comes just months after the SEC flagged those companies for failing to meet United United States auditing standards, leading to the assumption that maybe more businesses are about to follow. So here in the US, it's required that all companies follow strict disclosure requirements if they're going to be publicly traded. And that includes a fully verified third-party audit on a regular basis to ensure accuracy and transparency. This prevents disastrous scenarios like Luckin Coffee, which was accused of falsifying financials, raising money in the US, and then collapsing once those numbers proved to be unsustainable. And as of now, 261 Chinese stocks could be on the chopping block should they choose not to comply, which is a reality that we should be prepared for. After all, China responded by saying that they're reluctant to let overseas regulators inspect local accounting firms due to national security concerns. And with the clock beginning to tick down, either China needs to comply or over $1 trillion could be delisted from our US-based markets. The second, be aware that it could take a long time to unfold. Since China publishes their own numbers and maintains an extremely tight grip on their economy, there is no guarantee that they can't just keep kicking the can further and further into the future. And they have the ability to inject as much money as needed to resolve the situation, at least temporarily. And finally, in a weird way, China's slowing growth and global recession could help ease demand and upward price growth, meaning with less resources being consumed, inflation could begin to subside or even decline. Now, a lot of these are very broad assumptions without a definitive timeline for when they could unfold. But it is a very worrying sign that we're not going to know the full effects of what's to come until most likely it's too late. The listing of some Chinese stocks from the US stock market is a purely political event, and it's not accurate to link that in any way with the economic reality on ground in China. Finally, Graham does somewhat inadvertently admit his fault and admits that all his statements could be assumptions more than anything, and the Chinese government has the ability to stimulate their economy in case of trouble and forever kick the can down the road. To finish the video of, we think China does face some economic slowdown this year, but in no way are they about to collapse completely.